To let's keep it fictional today we have a very niche uh subject for you i am quite excited today to be talking about books with sentient some things so probably mostly like objects um but it's pretty much fair game we're we're open to interpretations for this one so think brave little toaster Toy Story, all of those things that should never be given faces or voices, <laughs> um, will receive them in our books today. Um, I'm very excited about this topic with like some hesitation, you know, I think it's really fun. And then you start to delve into it and you're just like, oh, my brain was not ready for this. Now I'm thinking about my toothbrush, having a face and a voice, and I'm putting it in my mouth. Um, I think that uh, Virginia might kind of like excel at this topic. I'm ex very excited to see what Virginia has chosen. But we are actually going to start with uh, Sadie today. I feel like, you know, you're a magical realism person, but usually that doesn't take the form of like sentient objects. So um, I'm excited to see what you have for us, Sadie. You can start us off. All right. So I am actually very, very happy that uh, that this topic was was brought forward, not necessarily because I have a lot of books that fill this topic, but because I actually found a new book uh, because of this topic that I really, really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, so Fiona mentioned, you know, toys, uh, toothbrushes, toasters. But what about a sentient sourdough starter? <laughs> How exactly would a sourdough starter be sentient? Can you can you put a face on a sourdough starter? I'm not sure. Uh, so, anyways, uh, the book that I have read for today is uh, called "A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking" by T. Kingfisher. And um, as I said, I'm I'm really happy that I read this book. It was it was a really fun and also had a bit of a kind of serious edge to it which which was nice uh, kind of to have that balance um i have not read any t kingfisher books before i know that kareen has talked about at least one um on the podcast in in the past and i i believe that um t kingfisher will sometimes write i think maybe some horror books um so yeah so i wasn't uh, super familiar with her work uh but i'm so happy i found it um so a wizard's guide to defensive baking uh takes place in a fantasy world and it follows mona mona is 14 years old and mona works at her aunt's bakery um mona is a very minor wizard all that she can do is work with dough that is the only thing that her power allows her to do she can tell the dough not to burn if it's cooking in the oven. She can tell bread to become maybe a little bit fluffier or not as stale if it's been sitting on the counter for a little bit longer. She can sometimes bring gingerbread people to life and make them do dances for the customers. But all in all, not a lot of real strength behind uh behind working with bread and working with dough and and she's okay with that um she lost her parents uh, about four years before our story starts um to a bad fever and so since then she has been living with her aunt and working in her aunt's bakery and she's she's honestly happy to do that um she's happy to make gingerbread people dance she's happy to infuse her scones and sweet buns and all of these things with little bits of magic so that they bring people joy. Now, when she was first starting to learn how to use her magic and she was first starting to learn um, how to bake at her aunt's bakery, she was trying to feed her aunt's sourdough starter. And unfortunately, she did not do a very good job with it. And the sourdough starter died. In a panic, Mona dug her hands into the sourdough starter and told it to live. Live, sourdough starter. You have to live. So it did. Thus, we have Bob 
we have Bob the sourdough starter. Now, there's a few interesting things about Bob. Um, Bob likes to eat normal things that sourdough starters like. He likes to eat flour. He likes to eat water. But occasionally, Bob likes to eat rats. And Bob likes to eat fish. And Bob will kind of eat whatever you put into Bob's barrel. So Bob now lives in the basement of uh, Mona's aunt's bakery. And Mona is kind of his favorite. He usually gurgles and burbles and extends a doughy tentacle whenever she goes down to say hi and to feed him. Um, so, so for the most part, Mona has a pretty good life. Until one morning, when she comes into the bakery to find a dead girl on the bakery floor. Not knowing what to do and knowing that in order to tell her aunt, who is currently sleeping upstairs, that there is in fact a dead girl on the bakery floor, she will have to step over this dead person. Um, so she stands there for a while, waiting, waiting. Finally, she decides, okay, she's going to do it. So she creeps around, she steps over this girl who she notices doesn't look much older than she does. And she goes upstairs to tell her aunt, responding as you normally would. Your, her aunt says, okay, we have to call the constables. We probably won't be able to open the bakery on time, but, you know, Mona, just make some sweet buns. The constables are going to want to have a treat when they come in. So Mona gets to baking. Uh, she's used to this. She's comfortable with this. And the constables come and they, they kind of take a, a quick look around. Don't really say anything. And then someone else shows up. Inquisitor Oberon, who works for the Duchess, and the Duchess rules their city. And Inquisitor Oberon comes to arrest Mona because he believes that she killed this dead girl on the bakery floor. She didn't, but she is taken up to the palace. She is locked in a room with no doors, no window, or one door, but no windows. Uh, and she is taken before the Duchess to stand trial for murder. Luckily, the Duchess comes to her defense and tells Inquisitor Oberon that it couldn't possibly have been her. She is just a girl. She did not kill this other this other girl, so to let her go. Luckily, he does her go, and she makes her way back home. Now, this ho uh, castle is many, many hours from her home, so she has to walk all the way back home. And on the way, she meets up with another minor wizard. And this wizard is called Nacarine Molly. And uh, Nacarine Molly's her only talent is to bring horses back to life. Now, this is quite useful for uh, the Nacarine. I, I think it's called Nackers. Nackers? Nacarine? Um, they are the people who take away dead horses. So she is able to move the horses once they have died so that they can get up and walk over to the Nacarine yard so nobody has to lift the horse. So Molly gives her a ride back on her dead horse, Nag. And right before she drops her off at, um, drops Mona off at her house, she says, Watch out, Mona. Us wizards, us small wizards, are in trouble. The spring green man is hunting us, and we have to be careful. Mona's not quite sure what that means, but she goes home. She's relieved that she has not been arrested. On her way uh, to her door, she gets attacked. Now, this attack comes from someone a lot smaller than Mona anticipated. Uh, this attack comes from a 10-year-old child, and this 10-year-old child is begging Mona to tell him where his sister Tibby is, because his sister Tibby went into her bakery, and she never came out. Mona knows now that this sister is, in fact, the dead girl on the bakery floor, and the brother, whose name is Spindle, has no idea what happened. So Mona has to explain to him what happened. And as they kind of go through this explanation and as they learn more about what happened to Tibby, um, Mona realizes that Nacarine Molly's words are true and all of the little wizards are in trouble. All of the wizards who have minor powers, not the ones that work for the Duchess, not the ones who can throw lightning bolts or fireballs, but the ones like them, the ones who can work with dough, the ones who can raise dead horses, or like Tibby, the ones who can sneak in the shadows and never be seen. They are all in trouble from the spring green man who is going around and killing wizards. Mona doesn't really know what to, t to think about this. She has her life, she works in her bakery, and that's that's it, that, that's all that she knows. Um, 
So the next day she goes in and there is the spring green man trying to kill her with a knife. She's able to get down into the basement and luckily she is able to throw her sourdough starter Bob onto the spring green man and get away. But now Mona doesn't know what else to do. She has nowhere to run. She has no one to go to. She doesn't want to involve her aunt and her uncle because she doesn't want them to be harmed. So she has nowhere to go and no one to help her. And that is where I will leave you with our story. Um, as I said, it it has a lot of really fun elements. It has a lot of really comic elements. There is also a sentient gingerbread person um, who stays with Mona for most of the story um, and who plays a very big part in our story. Um, later in the story, there are many sentient gingerbread people who are not quite as nice as uh, as her little gingerbread person. And then there's Bob. Bob the sentient uh, sourdough starter who comes in handy quite a lot later in our story. Um, Bob who kind of burns like acid if you put it onto people's skin, um, which might be able to be used as a weapon. You never know. Uh, so yeah, so it is a very fun story. But as I said, it it deals with some more serious topics as well. Um, throughout the whole story, Mona is struggling with the idea that she is a 14-year-old girl and she should not have to be dealing with this. She has been put into a situation because people older than her who are in charge did not do the things that they were supposed to do to protect the rest of the people. And so Mona is thrust into a position of having to protect herself, of having to protect others, and being seen as a hero when she didn't want to be a hero. She never asked to be a hero. Nobody wants, nobody wanted to be a hero. Um, and so she's having to struggle with kind of that idea of what do you do when when the grown-ups, when the people in charge mess up and and it's up to you to kind of fix things when it shouldn't be. Uh, so yeah, so that is a wizard's guide to defensive baking by T. Kingfisher. Thank you so much, Sadie. I love the idea of minor wizards. That's something I really like. Like this idea that, you know. A hum like a regular person could just could be a good baker, but like you know, a minor wizard might also just like have that same amount of talent, but it's but it's because of magic, not because of like practice. Also, you know, I feel like a lot of us can probably relate to to the sentient um, uh, sourdough starter, or you know, like having that thought when you're if you've ever had a sourdough starter of like how alive is this? Should I feel bad when I kill this? Like, and then this idea too, that it can like just grow. And it's like, where's the center of it? Where's the brain of the sourdough starter? So that idea really excites me, this this whole Bob thing. <laughs> I feel like Fiona might now be trying to uh, figure out a way to create a sentient sourdough starter. <laughs> and that might be their, uh, their new goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah go back to the whole like fungi oh I don't think you were there for that episode but um I read a really great book about about fungi that kind of relates <laughs> all right I'm gonna pass it over to Virginia this is I think in your wheelhouse Virginia I'm not sure if you agree but let's let's see what you've got oh I absolutely love sentient anything and I've talked about many sentient things on this podcast already sentient spaceships sentient hair in Kill the Mall by Canadian author Pasha Mala one of my favorite and of course who could forget sentient curtains who got a little upset when his owner started making other friends so yeah sentient anything is my thing but I'm so sorry I feel like I'm gonna be disappointing everybody because you know like I'm saying this all of this because I feel like for an episode dedicated to sentient objects I might have completed like half of the assignment <laughs> and I just nothing is definitely not as exciting as sentient sourdough and I think what you have in coming uh, Fiona would probably be better so I feel a little bit bad about it um even though, like, I should have, like you said, uh, so many sentient object books to choose from. But there's a reason why I decided to go with this book today, because I feel like at some point on this podcast, this book deserves a spot. And it is really the reason why I'm here today. It is the reason why I end up loving books, um, you know, and because and, this book introduced me to popular reading, because... I would before this book, I didn't realize the books that are written be you know not in the 19th century because that was what I was told to read. Read the classics, you know, like when I first came to Canada. And I mean, like I, I don't 
I, anyway, um, yeah, and this is also the book why I, I work at the library, because this is the first book I borrow out of my own choice from a public library when I discovered it in a paperback spinner at the Collingwood branch of Vancouver Public Library. That was my first book. So it, it means a lot to me. This is maybe even more basic than that. This is the book um, that may be responsible for why I am speaking and writing in English right now because I came back from vacation um, in the summer and my teacher, English teacher, Mrs. Nannery, asked me, well, like, what did you do this summer? Your writing is a little bit better your grammar is a little bit better what did you do and I said I read this these books and she was quite surprised so I feel like this book is like has a, is a big part of my life my reading life and it you know is a milestone for me um but you know I definitely feel like I cheated a little bit because I read this book like like what like 30 years ago and and even though I did reread like some of it for today's episode I only got about two-thirds of it and I feel like I, I should only get like partial credit to this assignment because it's been so long um and it's also kind of maybe not a book that I would generally recommend on the show um a little bit different but you know the book that that you know, I feel like it's, it's the on topic it's just like it's maybe not what I would normally would recommend is Christine by Stephen King. Now, it's not like Stephen King needs me to promote his books, um, but which is why I don't normally talk about Stephen King on this show. Um, but it was funny that like maybe it's just timely yesterday on social media, apparently Stephen King was trending because he commented on some podcaster ridiculous politics related post and the podcaster the guy was like oh I'm sorry I have millions of followers that listen to my show and who are you probably some old guy who still lives in your mom's basement and then proceed to make on some like really derogatory comments and like he clearly has no idea who Stephen King is so maybe maybe Stephen maybe we still need to talk about Stephen King I don't know Anyway, Christine, um, you know, if you don't know, and um, you may already be very familiar with the story because there's a movie being made of it. You can buy like the toy car, Christine. Christine is a car, a sentient car. Christine is a story of a love at first sight. Dennis and Arnie were driving home from their part-time job one day when Arnie fell in love. Dennis and Arnie, they're in the last year of their high school. They're really good friends, which really surprised a lot of people because Dennis is popular. He is in the football team. He get all the girls. And Arnie is also popular, but mostly among bullies because he is their favorite victim. They make fun of him all the time. But Dennis and Arnie grew up together and they have been friends since they were kids. And Dennis sees things in Arnie that maybe others don't see or maybe choose not to see. So they remain friends until today. So that day, they were on the way home, and Arnie yelled, Stop! Stop the car, Dennis! Stop the car! Back up! Back up! Back up! Back up! And there, when Dennis finally back up and stopped, there on the side of the road is a car with a for sale sign on it. Now, you don't need to know anything about cars to know that this car is a piece of junk. Someone has left it out there to rot. It looks like that it will never, ever run again. The, the dents everywhere, the paint is, paint is chipped. There's so many broken parts. The windshield has cracks on it. And who knows what's missing in this car? There is no way that this car can run anymore. But for whatever reason, Arnie was instantly in love. He got out of Dennis's car right away. He went up to the house and he started talking to the owner about buying this car, which is so weird and so uncharacteristic of Arnie because he has never talked about wanting a car and he also has no money. So what is he talking about? When Dennis tried to pull him aside and try to talk some sense into him, Arnie got really angry, really angry. And he was like, mad at Dennis for some reason and even though Dennis was just trying to be a good friend and talk some sense into him and Arnie keeps saying I have to have her I have to have her and when Dennis thinks back to that day the day that started this all he remembers Arnie saying her now I would love to have a time machine to go back in time to figure out what Virginia 30 years ago got out of this book <laughs> Because Stephen King, if you have not read Stephen King, uh, his books are long. 
they're like, this is like 500 page and it is classic paperback. It is dense. Like it's tiny, teeny, tiny little words. Um, and, and Stephen King loves his words. <laughs> so many words in it. So I really don't understand what I got out of it. But apparently it got me into books, into horror, into popular reading. And um, that, you know, I and and a couple of years ago when I went to a used bookstore, I just, I saw the copy, the same edition and the same cover. I just, I just had to buy one. Um, and I did not realize like how big this book is. Um, and, but rereading it, I think, I, I think I, I kind of understand why people love Stephen King's books because absolutely, you know, you hear most of them, you hear about the plot, but I think Stephen King's is best at characterizations and, and really descriptions of the place. You really feel you get to know the people and you get to know the place. And I feel like that's probably why people get really into them. Um, and as I said, like, you know, Stephen King definitely loves his words. <laughs> he uses a lot of words, <laughs> lots of sentences. Um, and being a book that is written in the 1980s, um, uh, it was not always comfortable reading it. There's definitely things in there, attitudes and 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 word choices that I it's it's uncomfortable to read this this day and age. Um, but um, I think you know, like it is it is definitely something that I I think I. Uh, you know, apparently, you know, like somebody who just came to Canada, um, you know, like have barely any English can actually read and got into like very much into it. So there must be something magical about it. Um, so yeah, I, 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 like I said, not usually my um choice of books, but um, I think Stephen King is one of those writers that have influenced so many writers. I always hear readers and writers talking about rereading his books and, and making it so almost like an annual tradition. That's what they do. Um, so it's really interesting to see. And I think no matter what, um, you know, like he definitely is a, a storyteller. Um, and I think, you know, there's so many ways to get his stories, if you are intimidated by the 500 page book you know there's a movie um, of almost like all his stories and all his uh, books and I think partly I keep thinking about like well why are there so many adaptations and I feel like it's because he described things so much that like there's always something you can already picture like what's going on and I and imagine adapting his stories were probably fairly easy because of that like he really really um, gives you the full picture of whatever that he's describing so yeah um Sentient Cars, that is my uh, Sentient Objects for today. So this is Christine by Stephen King. Thank you so much, Virginia. It was great to hear about a book that was so formative for you. Um, and I think you have convinced me it, I I need to read a Stephen King. I've never read a Stephen King novel. And it just like just to understand um, how he writes, I want to do it. Also, a great trope. Uh, and I imagine that... Um, Stephen King kind of spins it on its head because I'm thinking like Herbie the Love Bug, Transformers, and like, you know, we're like, oh, they're so like charming cars. And then it kind of like weirds me out that you're like going inside of them. Uh, or, oh, um, what's the one? Oh, I can't remember words, but it's like an action um, movie from the 80s. Uh, and the car is his sidekick not important uh anyway i do i love the sentient car trope uh but i think it lends itself to horror well which is a great uh segue into our existential question which is if you could imagine the scariest sentient thing what would it be i mean i want to say like a chainsaw would probably be pretty terrifying <laughs> Or any type of power tool that could hurt you without being sentient, if you imagine it now having a brain. <laughs> Pretty terrifying. But I'm also quite terrified of um, dolls coming to life and like children's toys coming to life. Um, we had uh, this little toy that we got for Evie and it was like that big. It was a stuffy. And you pulled on a, this thing and it played music but it would never fully go back in. So every now and then it would just like randomly start playing music, which was absolutely terrified. I think it may have happened in the middle of the night was like, it was, it was very scary. So yeah, the idea that toys and dolls, especially like porcelain dolls, I used to have a porcelain doll and it didn't scare me when I was a kid, but now thinking about porcelain dolls, 
them coming to life is, I, I would be very terrifying. Yeah, that was definitely what I thought about porcelain dolls. Like, I don't mind, like, in my mind, my Build-A-Bear owl is alive. Like, it is absolutely sentient. You know, we watch hockey games together. We talk. Um, so, uh, sentient, absolutely. But porcelain dolls, I mean, they're scary on its own. Like, I don't even need them to be alive. But, ew. yeah, I would definitely. That was the first thing that came to my mind in terms of scariest thing. Fiona? I mean, I think that Sadie maybe has it with like a chainsaw, but um, the one that really freaks me out is uh, food. And I know it's silly because we do eat things that were once alive, but like things like veggie tails and the like getting in your mind about then you're eating a cucumber and you're like, am I eating a delightful vegetable that wants to tell me Bible stories? And like, what happens when it gets to my stomach? And it's just all of these like spiraling thoughts in my head about about sentience things that really, that really weird me out. Um, okay. And then on the flip side of that, another like, you know, sort of the not scary, but fun sentient things is when, and like, I think especially in kids movies, you know, when the lead character has a pet who pretty much like takes the characteristics of a dog but it's not a dog it's like a book or like i don't know um uh what what do you think would make an ideal pet for a sentient thing i'm going to say a coffee machine i would love to have a coffee machine as a friend you know cuz coffee is already your friend right so a coffee machine would be but I would not drink coffee out of the coffee machine. We would buy us. We would, we would both own a different coffee machine. That that's where we make coffee. So my friend is not going to need to make coffee for me or anybody else. But we will have a different non sentient coffee machine that is responsible for making coffee for both of us. And we can sit and enjoy and talk about whatever. Um the the book that I I talked about uh does talk about the little gingerbread man, and I think that that would be really fun to have just like a little cookie that could just like sit on your shoulder and just like tag along with you. And then I'm also quite partial to like the Mrs. Potts, Beauty and the Beast, uh, just like warm, comforting, happy, sentient object. So I, I could have a Mrs. Potts who just would make me tea whenever I wanted tea. And yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that you both chose like objects with specific tasks. And I think that that is kind of the ideal. But then I get into this whole thing about like servitude. And it's like, I was born to create coffee. What if I don't want to create coffee? And then it just goes into the like the horror aspect. That's why my coffee machine doesn't have to make coffee anymore. It's just going to be my friend. Just your friend. <laughs> Mrs. Okay. Potts always seemed pretty happy to make to make tea like that. That seemed like what she wanted to do. Yeah, and I mean, she has another life too. Like, like she has a more complex life than that. She has a a, a child, and like maybe a, a romantic relationships with with one of the other objects. I feel like there's something implied. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I haven't watched. Lumiere has so one well. with the duster. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much um, for answering this. Okay, my sentient something book is a doorstopper. Uh, so it might take me some time to get to the sentient something aspect of it. Um, I chose a sprawling sci-fi by Anna Lee Newitz, um, and they are better known for their uh, nonfiction. And that definitely comes through as part of what I really enjoyed about it. Uh, it had like a strong base in like ecology and, and there's this whole section on urban planning in this um, futuristic Earth-like world. So the book I am talking about is The Terraformers. Oh, I feel like if you want something to make you think, this is a great book. If you have a threshold for how much you want to think about weird stuff, this might not be the book for you. I feel like it pushed me the perfect amount where I was uncomfortable, um, but also, you know, I was uncomfortable and like sometimes kind of frustrated. And then I would sit there and think about it all day. So even though it wasn't my absolute favorite book, I'm really glad that I read it because it it made me think about a lot of things. Then maybe 
don't come up in everyday life. Okay, so it's sectioned into three books. And that might be difficult for some readers because you sort of like you there's a track, um, but you lose all of the original characters, essentially, uh, like as you go through to the new book, they're just connected. So the first book is about uh, Destry. And she is a um, in charge of terraforming the environment on this Earth-like world. Um, it sounds sort of idyllic, uh, but but it's not. Uh, it's actually a uh, like a capital venture. So um, this world is being created to replicate Earth during the Pleistocene for these like. Pleistophiles, I guess you could call them. These like Earth files um, who will come from other worlds and they want the experience of being um, uh, a homo sapien um, during the Pleistocene. Uh, and basically it's it's just a cash grab. Um, but for Destry, it's it's her life. It's what her parents did. And it was it is what she was. Um, what do you say? It was it was what she was created for. It was what she was born for, like quite literally in a test tube. She has her mount. Okay, this is this is it. This is the jumping off point. This is the point of no return. She has her mount, Whistle, who is a robot moose who can fly. <laughs> Just accept it. It's easier that way. Um, and basically, um, a cast of characters along with um with Destry and Whistle discover that there's these squatters in a volcano <laughs> and they were actually um the people who were kind of uh who were um employed by the parent company employed and created by the parent company before them um to to do the job before them uh and they were supposed to kind of just go away and maybe be exterminated but instead they went in hiding into this volcano and they created this whole lavish um culture in this volcano so uh destry finds that out and then kind of realizes like oh parent company is really not very um reliable i can't really rely on anything they said um and uh, she becomes kind of like the broker of this, like, um, I guess, treaty between these, like, I shouldn't be calling them squatters. That's how that's how the parent company sees them. But I can't think of what they're called in the book. So this this group who lives in the volcano and the parent company. <sighs> it's very interesting. Um, we have all of these different kinds of characters, lots of mounts. And mounts are not just... Um, flying robotic moose but they might be <laughs> they might take the appearance of like more robots um and then there's also a sentient door <laughs> and the door but it, the door is really like a more like an ai who is like more like doesn't have a body and sometimes the door is the body and all of these other places it has a romance with a robot don't worry about it it's fine um so that's kind of that's the first book it's it's about destry uh it's about this like brokering this treaty i think i think i've got all the important things that you need to then get into the second book <laughs> Which is the urban planning book. So you have kind of a new character who's not Destry, but it's hard to distinguish them from Destry. Um, and their job is to like now plan plan out this this budding city um, where these people have moved in, uh, these like Pleistophiles, uh, these like people off worlders who've moved in for their like beautiful homes for this um authentic spirit experience of the Pleistocene and and these people who were living in the volcano who've come up now and are living on the surface and so because of this treaty there's um expectations about how the urban planning is going to be done to to suit everybody's needs and of course the parent company is always just trying to like do whatever's cheapest and and not respect those that treaty but uh so it's this character's job to to um 
<laughs> to go on this mission, collect information for this urban planning expedition <laughs> of how to, um, yeah, how to build things to to suit this uh, eclectic uh, bunch of of people who live on the planet. That's kind of the second one. There's a there's a lot more strange details, but but that's the gist of it. Okay, so this is where it both gets the most challenging and I think the most interesting. Um, the third book is about their solution to this urban planning situation, which is a sentient train. So they need a train, but they don't want it to be on tracks. But how's it going to... I can't I can't I can't remember why they come up with sending train but it's a good idea believe me it was a good idea So everybody is kind of born from a test tube and I think what the book is really about is about who gets to be a person and who doesn't and what happens when you make things into people like trains um and you've got these people living in the volcano who are very like you know, laissez-faire about it. They just, they they have the ability to create new things uh, and they want to do it. They're just excited about it and they don't necessarily think about the ethical implications. Um, and, but we get to explore some of those ethical implications through the book. There's this whole interesting thing that I really enjoyed called the, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's, it was basically a deal where they give animals, like this is like way back, like thousands of years ago, they give animals the ability to of human speech um, so that they can kind of like welcome them into this like um, partnership, basically. And so, you know, th- we want to like work with ducks, but we can't work with ducks unless ducks can speak. <laughs> so then throughout the book, they're seeing like, what do we push that to? Who who are we going to give human voices to? And then ultimately, like, let's breed sentient trains to be worker ants, but they also have freedom so they can choose whether or not they want to do their job. It was fascinating, but very challenging. The whole thing, like, um, it, it doesn't, it's not it doesn't it's not comical and it's also not super serious like it never has the self-awareness of like oh boy it'd be strange to have a sentient train because these people are just like yeah some things are sentient but as the reader you're just like this is bonkers um and and like sometimes it doesn't always land but again just like just the thoughts that i get to got to have while reading it i think were worth it um i've (laughs) Okay, I'm going to make it weird. I've always been bothered by like, you know, like children's shows like, um, oh, what's the one? Rupert? Like, I love Rupert Bear, but I don't understand why humans and animals live together and drink tea. Like, they have all the history of human history, but it's a different history and we never explore that. So this was like very much a like satisfaction of my childhood in adulthood where I got to be like, what if Rupert did a historical dive into why, why there were dog humans who had dogs as pets? Um, And that was really, really satisfying uh, for me, I have to say. So if you've ever had that itch or you've had the concern about those about those talking, singing vegetables, if you want to lean 100 percent into sentient somethings, if you want to think about personhood and it is very topical because of, um, you know, where we're at with AI right now um, to think about like who who gets to be a person. And also, what are the financial implications of that? Um, this is it. This is this is a detailed, hard sci-fi deep dive into what if animals and trains were sentient? What if Thomas, Thomas the Tank Engine existed? What if you created Thomas the Tank Engine? Yeah. If you want to go there, I encourage it. 
um but but don't don't think it's going to be a easy ride <laughs> i do wholeheartedly recommend the terraformers by annalee newitz um for a total ride uh yeah you know i feel like after that i i kind of would prefer some like sentient sourdough like maybe something with a self-awareness to say like this is funny and enjoyable um and less like i i could write a thesis on this yeah <laughs> all right thank you everybody so much i don't i'm i don't know if it's the topics or if it's just where i take them um but things always get weird when i host so thank you as always for for um for going down that that road with me thank you virginia thank you for sadie um there's a whole world out there of sentient something fiction and i i'm excited to continue reading in that vein we'll see you all next time um <laughs> next time you get in your car maybe have a thought about what it'd be like if that car was alive mm -hmm.